Welcome back to the Comic Book Historians Podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. Today we're very proud to have Mary Fleener, uh, independent comic book artist. In Understanding Comics, the Invisible Art, Scott McCloud uses Mary's work to explain non-iconic abstraction and is at the top of his pyramid alone and above everyone else. We're very honored to have her. Mary, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. So now we want... We, we like to start from like the beginning of the person, right? Like embryo stage almost. Uh, so you were born in 1951, is that right? That's right, up in uh, Los Angeles, California. In Los Angeles, so you're, you're, you're definitely a, would you say you're definitely a Southern Californian? Uh, second gen LA native. My mom was born in LA too. And uh, we, I, we've lived in California, um, my whole life, except for seven years when we lived in West Vancouver in British Columbia. Oh, okay. I was like uh, age nine to 15. Oh, that's cool. So I, I puber, pubertized up there in uh, Canada. <laughs> yes. And I'm imagining, I'm imagining both the embryo and the puberty in a cubist sort of way right now. So that's great. Um, so then did that time in Canada give you almost like a different cultural outlook a little bit as well? Yeah, yeah, it really, really did. First of all, the educational system up there is way better than the United States. Uh -huh. And I learned about things that, you know, they were never probably discussed here. Like the, you know, the, the uh, nationalism is not exactly a really good thing. Uh -huh. uh, the Canadians had a bit of a superiority complex where they thought they were better, better than the United States. Well, they are in a lot of things. Uh -huh. But they still had their racial problems with their First Nation people back then. And uh, but anyway, all I know is I was uh, the school there was very tough. It was like England and uh, they used corporal punishment. It was it was very English, but at the same time, very progressive. So now that's interesting that you say that. So as far as the progressiveness and the people in the schools, do you feel like that rubbed off on you before you came back to the United States? Or did you have a tendency toward that from earlier? No, uh, the, uh, for, for one thing, uh, they push girls in sports. Uh, mm -hmm. In the sports departments, there was no more money given to the football team than there was girls mm -hmm. playing basketball. And so that was promoted from grade five up to high school. Mm -hmm. So that was something when I came back to the States, there were, there were, all my events were gone. They didn't have discus. They didn't have javelin. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, in fact, I, the first school I went to when I came back was a Catholic girls school. They didn't even have sports. They had no money. Right. Uh, but the thing was that when we did come back, I was so well read and education was so good. I had, to, I skipped, uh, I was done with math. I was done with English. Oh, wow. I'd read all the books, and so by the time I was a senior at Palos Verdes High School, mm -hmm. the last three periods were art, <laughs> nothing but art for from lunch on till I went home. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, that's fascinating. So you felt like maybe as far as um, women in society, there was something missing uh, in the United States uh, in comparison. Well, there was certainly something missing in the school system with in regards to girls in sports. Yeah, and uh, the teachers were all pretty butch <laughs> so mm -hmm. that kind of put me off mm -hmm. and then I just went okay I'm done with sports but uh I got into art mm -hmm. that kept nice. me busy I, I hooked up with a bunch of art the art loser hippies at the high school and there you go there so clung that, to that, each other there was a creative refuge there okay um so now uh, as far as your parents your mom worked for Disney from 1941 to 1943 you said she was born in Los Angeles also, did, did she influence any of your creativity or foster it at all? Oh, absolutely. Not only did I inherit her, you know, genetic uh, ability for art, but she let me use all of her art supplies. Uh, that was absolutely. one thing that was not off limits. And I destroyed pretty much all of them. I didn't clean the brushes and I didn't put the paints away like I should have but I I never got in trouble for that it was really strange because they were mm -hmm. you know they were really strict about everything else but when it came to the art that was fine and mm -hmm. she uh she didn't start doing art as a child she was a child dancer with a group called the Meglin Kitties mm. and these little girls used to dance before the feet in the theaters before the movie came on and mm. we're talking 1925 26 
something right. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she was really part of that Hollywood scene at, at a young age. Judy, Judy Garland and her sisters were in the same troupe. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother sewed all the costumes for the little girls. Mm -hmm. So, and my grandfather worked for the health department. So we're really LA, LA people. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's really great. So, so there was a genetic artistic um, gene as well as the influence and the fostering of, of your creativity. Then we also read that your dad also was into little Annie Fanny. So you got to see some Harvey <laughs> from an, from an early age. Is that right? Well, he always had Playboy and he always had the dirty paperbacks on his side of the bed, which, you know, when parents weren't around, we'd look at them and everything. Uh -huh. And it's funny because Playboy really wasn't that raunchy. Yeah. Uh, in the 60s, it was very intellectual. Right, that's true. And, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the pictures were so tame by today's standards. It was just, and my mom had big boobs and I'd mm -hmm. studied art and I'd seen all these naked people and, you know, ancient art. So big deal right 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 but little annie fanny was it, it was just so well done and i was already a, a newspaper junkie kid like when the sunday paper would come yeah. i would grab the comics run to my room and nobody would see me for two hours maybe banging on the door going give us the paper so that they knew so awesome. i really liked cartoons and comics and comic art and of course since my mom worked for disney animation was okay most kids couldn't watch saturday morning cartoons but we could uh-huh and so uh, my dad started cutting, after I moved out of the house, he started cutting out the Annie Fannies for me and giving them to me so oh, I could awesome. read them. Did you, did you get a sense of who Harvey Kurtzman was at that point or did that come later? No, not really. That was, that was pretty much Bill Elder's show. When you, I mean, look at the art. As far as the artwork, it is Bill Elder, yes. Yeah, so when I finally discovered what Kurtzman did, I couldn't believe it's so loose. Yeah. That's not the same guy that worked on Annie Fanny, when in fact it was. Right. But that would really shock me when I finally saw what his artwork looked like. Yeah, yeah, because he, he was still doing the layouts for Annie Fanny, but illustratively elder. Yeah, and we, we, uh, we interviewed Bill Stout, and he told us that there was so much back and forth going on between Kurtzman and Elder in that, that it's, it's a really interesting, it's, but also kind of watered down by Hef in some ways, too. Um, now you were talking about the strips you were reading. You're, so let's go over some of those. That and these sound like they're influences in a way. So Chester Gould's Dick Tracy is that was that something you were into? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the, the his use of black and white. Nobody did anything like that. Nobody. Yes. And it was violent, and it was yeah. creepy. I think it was yes. the creepiest strip to the newspaper. And there it was on the front page. Every every. Uh, issue the herald examiner see in, in that those days there was the herald examiner in the la times yeah herald examiner had better uh they had a better comic section and remember the comic section was like 24 pages yeah it was a big deal and the pages were you know what what 18 by 30 or something the size yeah, of those big yeah. newspapers i have a, a copy of 1948 herald examiner and and the variety of styles just was unbelievable mm -hmm. i mean there was like uh Ripley's Believe It or Not. Okay, that's drawn in a real representational style. Then The Little King. Yeah, Little, Little King. King was so minimalistic and so funny. And I liked it because it made fun of the kings. Yes. I was born I was born an atheist and anti-authoritarian. Uh -huh. I never respected authority. I mean, you read history books and the kings are always terrible and they screw everything up and everybody goes to war. Yeah. So that's why I like The Little King because they kind of poke fun at him. Yeah, by Otto Soglau, yes. And then little Abner, of course. I mean, how could you not like little? I mean, I know Al Cap was a creep and everything, but the little Abner was terrific. It was unbelievable. Yeah. It was real comedy. And then the yeah. other thing about the comics is there was lots of TNA. When I was a kid, Brenda Starr was sexy and yeah, you know, and and you know, um, uh, Moon Moonbeam McSpade was kind of <laughs> kind of sexy. And then there was a script called Long Sam. Uh -huh. And she was a mountain girl, hillbilly girl, and had the mother with the you know the pipe in her mouth and a shotgun in her hand. Yeah, and guys were always getting lost on the mountain, and they'd end up there looking at Long Sam going gong gong gong. <laughs> and that didn't run very long, but that was pretty pretty racy. Yeah, Batman. that's right. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Also, um, Frank Thorne, we interviewed him once. He he likes that kind of stuff as well. That's oh, cool. he was amazing. Yeah. Okay, so you're a fan of Frank Thorne too. That's cool. Um, 
Hey, so man, then, one, one quick question, Alex. Um, yeah. What about uh, what about Pogo? And the, the reason I ask is because of I know how much you like True Swamp and John Lewis's thing. And I, I read the B book and I want to talk. I can't wait to talk about that. But was Pogo too late in time or, or you just didn't it, it wasn't one of yours? Well, I had a lot of trouble reading when I was a kid. And I kind of learned how to read by reading the comic strips because mm -hmm. they had the pictures so you could figure out the story from the pictures. So by the time I was in the fourth grade, I could not read. And my parents and the teacher oh. got together and they went, oh my God, she's been buffaloing us this whole time. So my dad had to, had, my dad had to tutor me at home. I get home from school and I was back in school again. Yeah. And then after about three months, it clicked. So for me, reading Pogo was very difficult the I, the italic lettering bothered me because I sort of have a little bit of dyslexia, but they didn't call it go. that back then. Right, right. And I, oh, I that's this interesting. Day, oh yeah, to, that's why I could do printmaking because I can think backwards. Uh huh. And when I'm typing, but you don't I always you type, don't like doing lettering to this day. That's your least favorite part of doing comics, right? Well, no, not really. I do like doing lettering. I, I, in fact, I like doing fonts and uh, I've done a couple uh, covers for Mineshaft and I really got into finding the old fonts from the speedball pens and, and once you get into it, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, no, I just couldn't, as, as, at that age, try to look at Pogo, the art was cute, but I, reading it was frustrating it's more, for more difficult yeah it did it have to translate um, it back into english almost from the thing that, that that he's doing with it yeah i totally get that that's interesting yeah i actually yeah, I, know, I actually have a hard time reading pogo that's funny it's because the words sound like other words and that, that kind of messes with me a little bit well see i'm a it, southerner so for me it was natural i didn't have right, any problem people actually it. probably talk like that uh, i see what you're saying absolutely yeah yeah well i have got to be honest i've never really read a whole pogo strip mm -hmm. for that very reason so when i was doing billy the bee i got a pogo book from the bookstore and i started looking at it and i had that same queasy feeling like it was just so hard to look at and hard to read and i kind of don't get what he was trying to do and I, right. and I really should sit down one day and 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 try to get power force through myself it. to read it yeah yeah now, um, we also read that you like Steve Ditko stuff. Is that right? Um, I'm not, I'm not, not really. Not I really, really, right? Know anything. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really ignorant about the Golden Age stuff. Okay, okay. And we, then we didn't um, have comic books in our house. Now, was Zap, uh, was that an influence on you at all? Oh, absolutely. That, 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 that changed everything. Okay. That, the cosmic wheel turned the day that. We, um, <clears throat> we were all in high school and uh, we had this one friend and he was a rich kid and he had all the latest albums and all this stuff. So we we're going to go to his house and we're all going to smoke some pot, right? Yeah. And he had a stack of these Zap comics. Yeah. So we started looking at them and I just, I, I'll never forget that day. I can remember almost every minute of the day and we really? never did smoke That's that. Amazing. We never did just smoke that pot. We didn't have to. Yeah. And we, well, the first time I looked at those jam pages of crumbs, we all looked at the stuff and we went, this guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, so now, um, is that right that you were selling some of your art by the time you were 15? Is that true? Yeah. Okay. And how was that at school or how'd that work out? Well, there was a little shopping center near where my mom lives and uh, they had a little gift store and I'd already been doing, uh, you know, uh, macrame and, and embroidery and all, all these kind of arts and crafts that you do in school. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom went to some fair and she came home with a wine bottle that had been painted uh, like Italian style, like flowers and very traditional. Right. And my brother had model kits. And I thought, well, I'd like to try that. Uh, you, and I found out the kind of paint you use. You didn't use acrylic because that would paint, peel off the glass. Mm -hmm. So I started putting enamel and painting flowers on these wine bottles. And my mom's a big wine drinker. So I had a bottle a day to work on. <laughs> and so I started selling those things at the little gift shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, and even back then, they took 50%, just like all the galleries do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, every month I have a check for like, you know 40 50 bucks that's cool yeah 
Yeah. That was a lot of money in 1968. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course, I didn't spend it. I didn't save any of it. I spent it on candy and <laughs> cigarettes and records. <laughs> <laughs> that's a breakfast of champions right there. Yeah, that's um, right. The, the food groups. <laughs> so then uh, now you mentioned that you were, okay, so you went to Cal State Long Beach for printmaking, like you mentioned. That was until 1976. Um, and then Roberta Gregory was there at the same time. Did you know her then? Was, was, uh, 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 were your comics influenced by teachers? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, I, uh, okay, first of all, I did not know Roberta, even though we were probably less than 300 feet apart. Uh -huh. There was okay. the illustration building across in the courtyard, and then we were the printmakers on the north side. Uh -huh. And I wish I'd known her, and I wish I'd known Phil Ye, because he was there too at the time. Oh, yeah. Because I, I went for four years to a junior college called Harvard Junior College in Wilmington, and mm -hmm. I loved it. It was great. I, you know, it was, it, that was, you know, during all the hippies and all that kind of stuff. And then I went to Long Beach, and oh, my God, it was just so lonely and, and impersonal. And um, I didn't make any friends, and I didn't make any boyfriends. In fact, I'm writing my new book. The first chapter is about the last days of my uh, life at that college before I just dropped out, walked out the door. Okay. And it was, uh, I, I actually left in 75. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. I, I was just, uh, after a, a series, in fact, I just finished chapter one and I'm about to ink that. And, um, uh, it was just, I was, uh, had nothing to say. I had no vision. Uh, I was taking, you know, 16 units. It was just, it was just too much. Uh, having a friend like Roberta and a boyfriend would have probably kept me in there. And then I caught my teacher having sex with a TA in, in one of the galleries. <laughs> and so I was just like totally disillusioned. I'm like, oh, so this is how it worked. I couldn't get a job on the campus and I had no money. So it was just a combination of things where I just said, screw this. I'm taking charge. And I'm not, I threw away all my art supplies. Oh, wow. And I got a job in a music store and I said, I'm a musician now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm that's done with cool. This art trip. Well, there I didn't think go. I could draw anymore. And what I was doing was poisoning myself with all these solvents and nitric acid and acetone and paint thinner and staying up all night, you know, doing all nighters in the print room. And, and I, I had a, a, I don't know, I didn't have a nervous breakdown, but I just said, I've had it. I'm done. I'm done yeah. with this shit. Hey, hey, Mary, at the huh. junior college, at the junior college, I read that, um, that was where you used uh, comics. I don't know if it was the first time, but you were using comics on those posters that you were doing for the uh, ecology uh, professor? Yeah. Well, what I was doing, I, I started, okay, I I didn't want to copy the Zap comic guys, but I really liked the whole attitude. So I started doing these little things called phallus, funny, phallus funnies, and they looked like little worms, mm -hmm. but they were phallic shaped. <laughs> and I draw them out in the courtyard and, and trade them to people for joints. <laughs> little bits of marijuana. Oh, that's awesome. And then my uh -huh. biology teacher, he wanted to start this new class called ecology. That was a brand new word, a brand new thing, ecology. So he asked me to draw a, a poster for the class. And I still have it, but it's so faded. You could barely see it. But it was done on a mimeograph machine. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's probably for my first real comic page oh that's cool wow so it's it's a, a hippie with afro with a poncho and he's looking in a microscope and all of a sudden these little uh paramecians and little little mitochond mitochondrians or whatever you call them they start dancing <laughs> around they sing a little song about this class and how you know what time it is and uh -huh. and it was very very underground influence so yeah so that kind of that's kind of where it started oh that's awesome wow that's really great and then um one more segue into what Jim's going to go over. So you became a custom picture framer when you got out. You moved to yeah. en Encinitas in 1981, still live there. And you started drawing little comics and letters you would send to your L.A. friends. One of those friends had you read New Comics, a piece by Matt Groening, the Simpsons guy in the L.A. Weekly. How did that impact what, what you were doing in that stage of your life? Well, that was another turning of the cosmic wheel. because. Uh, uh, the guy I was, uh, well, 
I was writing to a lot of people because I'd never written letters before. Uh-huh. And so we moved here in 81 and I suddenly found I really liked writing. And it's weird because when I was in high school, I took one of those aptitude tests because I've my grades are so terrible. My parents were like, just like, she's not that stupid. So I took these tests mm-hmm. and the number one thing it said I should be as an artist. And then underneath it was writer. And I'm going, writing, I hate English. <laughs> Writing's a drag. Yeah, poo. <laughs> so, so I started writing these letters and at the bottom, I put little comic strips and, and one of them was a little, I had a little black flea that lived on a white dog and I call it little mofo. And, um, because I, you know, I thought, you know, I, you know, crumb and dead angel food mixed spades, so big deal, right? And so this friend of mine, Don Waller, who was in a band with my husband, they had a band called the Imperial Dogs, and he was a, a worked for Radio Record magazine. He wrote a book called The Motown Story, and we, we, you know, we're we're good friends. So he wrote me and said, "Hey, you got to get a copy of this L.A. Weekly." Or, uh, issue with that Matt Grady did with a with a rabbit on the cover and I yeah. go why he goes well they've got this whole thing about underground comics and I go but they're they're dead he goes well not anymore so when I got the article the first paragraph described me to a T because were you the kind of kid in school instead of listening to the teacher you would draw and then when she'd look at you, you'd crumple it up in a piece of paper and shove it in the back of your little desk and I go <laughs> yep. that's me because if you saw my, the desks when back in the day, they were like uh, kind of hollow. You could put your books in there. Yeah. Well, mine had about eight inches of crumpled up paper that was just shoved in the back. Uh-huh. And because I would draw because I wasn't interested in school. I just wanted to draw. And and where I, in, in West Covina, when I was, before we moved to Canada, it was like a hundred degrees there. So how could a kid concentrate with that heat? We didn't have AC. Right. Hell, the, the teachers are so badass, they'd shut the door and make you sit in an even hotter room. Because <laughs> they were so mean. They were mean. So anyway, I get this ish, I get this thing, and I got the address for uh, Weirdo, Robert Crumb, Dennis yeah. Warden for uh-huh. uh, Slur. Uh, there was a gang magazine called Teen Angel. Yeah. And they were up in East L.A. and then Raw Magazine. So I wrote to, I just go, Robert Crumb's address. Oh my God. So I wrote him and he wrote me back, which was just like, Oh my gosh. And then I wrote Dennis Warden and it was amazing because he lives up in, he lived in San Juan Capistrano. Yeah. And we became, uh, we became lifelong friends. Oh, nice. He's up in Medford now, but I think stick boy and Dennis Warden's work was just some of the, the best stuff. Yeah. He's really, really talented. Uh-huh. And then, uh, when Krem wrote me back, he sent me a copy of Weirdo, number 13. So that was like, you know, it's, it's, it's been happening. It's about 1984. Uh-huh. And I think Weirdo started in 1980, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's going to be the next comic section that Alex is going to do. But I wanted to go back back to high school first and talk about music because you have twin artistic avenues and i i didn't want to leave that part out so if we Good. can we i'd like to go back to to high school and and how music was impacting your life at the same time both as a performer and a listener okay well it actually started when we lived in canada and i was 14 years old and i was totally into bob dylan and the rolling stones and folk music was kind of still popular but up in canada it was ian and sylvia and gordon lightfoot it really wasn't like the protest stuff like joan baez and pete seeger although i really like that kind of stuff and uh, a couple of my girlfriends wanted to form a band and they go well you can't be in the band unless you learn guitar and i go yeah good points <laughs> my brother had a guitar and he has no musical ability he has no artistic ability so he gave me the guitar and it was one of these guitars where the strings are like, you know, about an inch off the fret. You just really hurt your hand, you know, hurt your fingers. But I was determined. So I, I started practicing. And then we moved away from Vancouver back to the States. So I was kind of on my own for about a year. So I just practiced and practiced and practiced. And at the school, I went to St. Mary's Academy. At noon, all of us, you know, um, uh, future rock stars we get together in the art room and we play monkey songs because the monkeys were really hot back then 
I didn't like the oh, monkeys. Sure. They were just a they were a, a band that was a fake band, but boy, they were really popular here. I gotta shut my door here. My dogs. Anyway, so when I got out of went back, uh, say finished one year of that school, and then I ended up at Palos Verdes. Then I really got into doing the hoot nannies and being the you know the head of the folk club. And it wasn't really a folk club. We all wanted to play Frank Zappa, but, but you know you had to call it the folk club. And so I started doing the hoot nannies, and um, by that time I didn't really want to do folky stuff. I got into the music of Shel Silverstein. Sure. And he he's a guy that did um, I'm being eaten by a boa constrictor, <laughs> and uh, he wrote a boy named Sue. And so yeah. I we used to do the song called "You're Always Welcome at Our House," and the lyrics are basically a little kid goes into a yard and they 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 abduct him and seal him inside of a wall or eat, they eat him or something. And it's really dark, but I thought it was funny. So I, so I was in the shell. I didn't start learning electric instruments or electric bass until I was like 24. I got a job at a music store. And so then I was able to buy an amp and all that stuff and, and really concentrate on, um, you know, playing an electric instrument but i started out with an were, acoustic were you guitar. in bands at all i mean were you forming bands with your friends not in high school uh in high school bands were a boys club <laughs> there, there wasn't a guy there that would have a woman in a band it was uh it just wasn't done so when i started learning bass then i started playing with uh jamming with guys and people that i knew that uh yeah, you know, a lot of change from 1969 to 74. Yeah. So a lot more. So, so I, I guess the first band I was in was a uh, a Chuck Berry tribute band. And so I learned a lot about 12 bar blues from being in that band. And that's a, if you're going to play rock and roll, you got to know you've got to know 12 bar blues. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, you know, it was just uh Maybe a couple, I mean, I was in a band while I did was sing harmony and bang a tambourine. But then about 1975, I met a woman who played keyboard and uh, we started playing all the gay bars in Orange County along Garden Grove Boulevard. So that's what this new book is about. Oh, about, you've, you've done some, I've read some of your comics about that, uh, yeah. that experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've covered that, but not to the extent that I want to talk about it now because the kids that are young adults now are lucky because they can be the gender that they want to be they can be they can can express the sexuality they want to but boy back in the 70s if you said you were gay people thought you were a child molester and sure. uh, transgendered i mean my god if you walked down garden grove boulevard drag you would get murdered but that was weird that in that Orange County area, there were more gay bars there than there were up in Hollywood. So for about a year and a half, I played every Friday and Saturday and Sunday from 9.30 till 1.30 in the morning. And that's how I paid my bills. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, the, I, I love those stories. Some of them um, about those those early performances you were doing, like even the first first night you were performing there in, in that bar. With, oh, there was with a the big drummer. Fight. Yeah, the big fight and the uh the crazy drummer, the big fight, then the party at your house when you go back, all of that is is uh that's a good story. So I, I look well, forward to the new stuff. Well, it's gonna be uh even more get down because I'm not afraid to talk about I was you know, when you I, I I've been saying this lately. When you go back in time and do stories about you know things you remember, it's like walking through battery acid, because you like it, it's there's a lot of painful things I'm trying to talk about that I was afraid of talking about. But after I did my story for Drawing Power, the the book that Diane Newman edited, uh, I, I I read I that about, I read that this morning. I, I read yeah. your story there this morning. I want to talk about that because that was that was very powerful. Yeah, and it was I was a, I, horrible. It was weird. I was I was madder at the old boyfriend than I was at the at the rapist, basically. And and I know that's how you set it up, but it it, it was it was a really interesting story. Um, 
uh, and I can't wait to read the whole book actually, uh, but I, um, and the different contributors, but, but I read yours in researching this and that was, that was great. Well, I'm glad you got it because, uh, I hadn't, you know, wanted to write about that story. I didn't want to talk about it. My husband didn't know what had happened to me. And then when my friend betrayed me, I go, now I got a story. <laughs> now I got a story because this is, if anything illustrates the Me Too movement, it's when people say, thing like, they say things like that. Well, why did you go on that date? What were you wearing? Well, why were you drinking? What were you thinking? And that's what really hurts. And it's almost like it was your fault. I say we we went through a lot of different drummers. We went through three different drummers, and one of the drummers became a very famous pop, punk rock guy named Nicky B. Who ended up playing with the Weirdos and the Cramps and the Mau Mau's and the LA Guns. And so I talked to him. I I found him on Facebook, and I hadn't talked to him for forty years. So it's kind of neat, like doing the research for the B book, going back and talking to these people that that I hadn't talked to for a long time, and. Well, I wanted to let him know what I was doing too. I said, you're going to be in my book. Is that okay? And he was like, yeah, yeah, you can use my name and everything. And I'm like going, well, maybe we'll see. Now, now you, you were playing a certain kinds of music, but you had a pretty wide uh, range in terms of your interests. Cause you like, you're like a Chet Baker fan too, right? Oh, I love Chet Baker. Me too. He's one of my oh, yeah. favorites in terms of that. So, so that's not, you weren't limited. You were exploring everything in terms of, of music. Uh, was that going back to early days? Well, yeah, it was actually, because um, when I was like in the fourth grade, I really liked this woman named Dorothy Provine. And she was a singer on a, um, a show on TV called, uh, oh, what was it called? Oh, it, was, it was a gangster show uh, about the, it was called The Roaring Twenties. And so it was about a bunch of guys, a bunch of cops trying to fight the mob. And every every uh, show, they'd have a nightclub scene, and she'd be the act. And she'd sing all these songs like, I want to be loved by you, you know, and, uh, you know, 20 stuff. And I just thought that was so great. My mother thought I was out of my mind. She goes, that's old music. How do you like that old music? And, but, but it was terrific. So I was never just rock and roll. And then when I became a teenager, I rejected rock and roll, and I started uh, getting into jazz so I was really lucky uh, I got to go to the lighthouse I got to see Bill Evans I got to see Mose Allison I got to see uh John Handy uh you know when I was 18 so I couldn't drink of course but you could get in the club so uh that's what I did I, I really got into jazz and I really my favorite is Miles Davis of course sure but I saw him uh, at the Hollywood Bowl and he was so into cocaine oh my god he'd come on the stage and go honk and then he'd leave for 20 minutes. They come back, go, honk, honk, and then he'd leave for another 20 minutes. You're going, oh man. That's that's yeah. priorities right there. You gotta love that. Uh, oh, <laughs> and it was all that fusion crap. So I saw I saw, you know, John McLaughlin, Tony Williams, uh, Stanley Clark, and they were the most boring concerts because everybody was trying to fusion, fusion, yeah, it's really great. Oh God. <laughs> but I saw them all. I like your commentary. So, That's cool. I, I, if, and your commentary feeds into your comic, so it's cool actually verbally hearing it as well. That's awesome. Well, well I, I wanted do. to segue. I, yeah. I wanted to segue into that because at what point did you? I know it, they weren't published till a little later, but when did you start doing like this chicken slack stuff where you were putting lyrics into comics form? Um. The first time I did that was for the that little zine that they put out for WFMU. Uh huh. It was that station out. What was that? New Jersey was it? Well, they had a little. Uh, it was either every month or every other month a uh, program guide, and they hired a lot of people like Kaz and you know, all the raw, raw and uh, weirdo people to do artwork. And they paid pretty well. So they wanted me to illustrate Golden Birdies by Captain Beefheart. And yeah. so that was the first time I illustrated a, a song. And it was just like, oh, this is so, this is so right. Because <laughs> rock and roll songs are little stories, right? And right. then um, I did Sign DC, I think. That was that song by Love. Arthur Lee wrote that. 
and uh, I forget what the year the first chicken slacks was. Um, I've got the wait a minute. The first issue was just sort of anything anybody wanted, but then we had a psychedelic issue, we had a soul issue, and then a punk issue. So uh, the second, let's see, about 1988. Yeah. And uh, everybody donated their art, uh, except for the psychedelic issue. I made some money in a, um, well, I won't tell you how I made it, but you can guess. So I was able to pay everybody <laughs> 10 bucks a page. Yeah, it's a psychedelic issue. So what the heck, right? And uh, God, we had, God, we got some good good people. I mean, it was amazing the 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 effort that people put into the the songs, like Mark Martin doing "Let's Get It On" with those frogs. God, I, I still laugh when I look at that. Did you yeah, I remember the 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 Grateful Dead when they were doing those the Grateful Dead comics some of the art on that some of that stuff was just fantastic you did something on that too didn't you oh yeah I, I we were they asked us what songs we wanted to do and I go oh I've got to do Saint Stephen because Saint Stephen that's like you know I'm not a deadhead but I've seen them three times and twice I felt that magic I was in the middle of that crap everybody had their shirts off <laughs> And they're all dancing around and they were jamming and they were doing this sophisticated jam that was like something that like Coltrane would do and and I I, I got caught yeah. up in it. I, and I I I I I'm getting chicken skin right now even thinking about it you know talking about it and it was it was well, they were good they were that good but their records yep. I was yeah. never impressed with their record American Beauty was okay but the record that's never a good quite album captured. Yeah, they never quite captured. I like Working Man's Dead too, but but yeah, 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 that I, one too. I know what you mean. Well, those are that was sort of like their American songbook. Those two, they, they, they almost every song on there is like a classic. Yeah. So anyway, uh, when Kitchen Sink decided to do the uh, Grateful Dead book, I was torn because it was work for hire, and I wasn't really happy about that. But I did know that. Jared Garcia was a big EC Comics fan, and the rumor I've always heard is as soon as they made money, he bought all the back issues uh, from collectors so he could have them. Oh, cool. So he was into a very, and so since it's work for hire, that means they could use the art for anything they wanted in the future. But I figured they probably wouldn't use mine because it wasn't uh, realistic enough, like the EC Comics, if you, if you know what I'm saying. So when I did my version, St. Stephen, I just tried to dredge up every graphic hippie cliche <laughs> I could think of that. So if they did use my stuff in the future, I wouldn't feel too bad about it because I, I really didn't, um, I wasn't giving away very good ideas, just sort of good ideas that I copied from some other hippie, right? Anyway, oh, that's great. we had to do a blue line. It's the only time I've ever colored a blue line and it was horrible. I, I, I'm so glad there's computer uh, computer coloring now. That was really hard. That was really difficult. I hated it. But I like the comment. Alex, you want to you want to follow up on uh, on Weirdo now? I think that's where we go from here. So um, now, uh, just a uh, a couple notes. So, and you'd you'd also alluded to it earlier, but the crumbs and Mickey Rats, Robert Armstrong, were also important to your start. Crumb sent you copies of Weirdo when he was the editor, and that was encouraging. Tell us about that interaction. Well, it was so encouraging because uh, after all the head shops were closed, and I think it was 1978 or 79, uh -huh. you couldn't find underground comics anymore. Right. Then about, uh, I don't know, somebody gave me a, a pile of arcades. So I knew there were still people drawing, but... I didn't know, you know, I, I was just like, it was a mystery. How did, how do they do these comics? I mean, how do they get published? Who, who would even pay them? Right. It was just like this other universe. Yeah. So when Crumb sent me the first weirdo I got, it was like fresh energy. It was, it was wonderful to see a new crop of people, a yeah. new, new bunch of people, a new attitude, no more, you know, Hey man, I took acid last night for the hundredth time. Oh, oh, oh. Well, that got, you know, there were so many comics that did that. It got old or the guy, yes. you know, having sex with a woman on acid or it was just, you know, everything was on acid. Right. And now this was a different attitude and it really appealed to me. 
Uh-huh. And Bob Armstrong's Couch Potato Newsletter, that was actually the first comic that I got paid for. I did this little strip called the Techno Cats. And uh, I liked his Mickey Rat, I just think is the funniest comic book. That's my top 10, Mickey Rat. I see. Uh-huh. And, and I actually got the idea for doing my Cubist style from Bob. Oh, cool. Because there's a, there's a strip on the back uh, where the rat goes to a movie. Uh, he goes to a porno movie. And on the stage, Bob drew the figures very cubistically. Uh-huh. And, and then the punchline, of course, at the end is, oh, the book was better. You know, aha. Uh-huh. But um, I look at that drawing, I go, gosh, you know what? People should draw comics like Picasso, not by, like Picasso, because I don't like that guy. But right. I was thinking this Cubist kind of thing, everybody does realistic. Well, why yeah. not make it wild? I mean, you can get away, you can draw anything you want in comics. Yep. So that kind of, that, that lit up, you know, lit my light bulb. And that's when I started doing the techno cats and making everything geometric and. Yes. Trait. Well, I'm influenced by Art Deco too, so uh-huh. it wasn't a in art in ancient Egyptian art. Those are my things. Yes, that I like. right. And there's like almost like a 2D art with those hieroglyphics, right? And that they're illustrating something in this 2D sort of way, and then combining that with like a cubist, and now you have like this different kind of art form. I see. What, I, I, I now that you mention it, um, yeah, I guess looking through your comics, like I can feel that. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, God, but I went to the King Tut exhibit up in L.A. I went three times. Uh-huh. I was like, I, I, I know I was reincarnated from the ancient Egyptian times. The colors wow. they used, the designs, it looked like stuff I did. Yeah. It, it, it was, it was, I was like, I was, I, I got kind of misty eyed. Yeah, you felt point. a connection. Very, really? Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, and I love carnelian and I love turquoise. <laughs> so. Yeah. How fun. So then um, now uh, Peter, Peter Bag was the first to actually publish your stuff in Weirdo. And that started out in the letters columns, right? This was around yep. 1985 or so? Yep. Yeah. What was he like as an editor? Well, if he liked it, he used it. If he didn't like it, he didn't use it. And <laughs> so, <laughs> in fact, he was interviewed by somebody and he was talking about me because what I did was I, um, I wanted to be in Weirdo. But I thought it would be really uncool to like send a letter like, this is my submission. Oh, I hope you like it. Uh, uh, here's my phone number. So I just started sending him art. And he told this guy, he goes, I didn't know what she was doing. Was it a submission? Was she trying to be friendly? I mean, I, I couldn't figure it out, you know? Yeah. And, and then slowly she got better. And yeah, my first stuff stunk. And when he wouldn't use it, I didn't take it personal because I was just starting. And I always thought cartooning was like learning a musical instrument. You got to, you got to woodshed for three years, three to five years. Yeah. I mean, you just have to. So um, I did this little comic strip called, uh, what was it? All in a Day's Work. And it was Godzilla blowing down a city. And at the end of the day, he has a, a cigarette or something. I forget yeah. exactly what it was. But Pete goes, oh, I'd like to run this. And I go, well, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I got a whole 10 bucks for that. <laughs> That's but good. It was fine. To start. I didn't care. Yeah. Anyway. Now, um, and, and Weirdo had uh, three different periods under uh, Robert Crumb, Bag, and Aileen Crumb. Can right. you describe the difference in their styles? Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, when Crumb was the editor, he was trying to, from what I've now that I've, you know been to, you know kind of heard a little more and John did the book he wanted to be the anti raw magazine right and so he wanted to use outsider art and stuff like uh, the frog you know by that uh, outsider artist oh god what was the guy's name Neil or something oh. yeah you know, the frog goes I'm gonna cut you that one. <laughs> <laughs> and he's using like elephant Eleanor Norfus, you know uh-huh. the, the, the crying elephant with the guitar and all this stuff it was just ugly but to me I thought it was great I, I mean I, I'm, I'm sick I mean I'm one of these people at the party I like looking at slideshows right I like looking at people's pictures of their vacation and I really like the pictures that are out of focus and look bad <laughs> <laughs> there's a dark undercurrent like- in those photos yes yeah, I mean, it's, it's int- more interesting than something that's perfect. So, uh, Crumb's Weirdo was outsider art. Uh, 
uh, a lot of those photo funnies, which I thought were great. I yeah. loved the photo funnies. Uh -huh. Some people hated them. I, I thought they were great. So he, he had more of a, oh, what would you, uh, like I said, outsider art appeal. Peter yeah. Bag, he was going for the New York Stop Magazine, Punk Magazine guys, Holstrom and J.D. King and the Wise Ass, you know. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Wise I Ass. I mean, that, that that definitely um, like his uh, his his Bradley comics. Those there's a lot of Wise Ass in that. You're right. Yeah. Well, it was sort of a it was a kind of humor that Mad Magazine had that was very subtle. And he raised it up to sort of more of a snot nose level, which was fine. I thought a lot of it was, uh, some of it was uh, mean spirited, and I yeah, won't tell I you which ones. Uh -huh. But I don't think you should make fun of other artists. Uh, it's okay to make fun of artists. Like you know, it, parodies are good, uh -huh. but to be to to be real, accuse people of just doing things for money and and mm. not really being. Uh, the, the satire was a little thin. I see what you're saying. Stuff. Yeah. Then when A. Lee took over, of course, she was publishing a lot of women that that were uh, not just because they're women. She was publishing the stuff she liked. They just happened to be women. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. So I'd say more autobiographical, and A. Lee was doing the materials more autobiographical that she published because uh, we went on a cartoon vacation. Let's see, we went to visit Bob Armstrong, Crab, Bob Crab, and Kate Kane, and then we ended up at the Crumbs, and I started telling the story about my mom, talking to her on the phone, explaining to her that I was editing tits and clits. Yes, yes. And she, they started laughing. She goes, oh, you've got to do a story. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. And I go, well, all right. And so that ended up in Weirdo. Yeah, um, that's cool. A, a mother and daughter chat. Yes, yes. Um, and... Uh... Yeah, I, I noticed uh, that. Okay, so then Aileen, she had the emphasis on women, also autobiographical strips, right? To like where I the artist so. would like then talk more about their own life experiences. And it seems like you, like, because you were to start out with that Madame, Madame X from Planet yes. Sex, right? That was kind of like an earlier thing, wasn't it? And then it kind of went into more autobiographical things. Is that is that right? Well, yeah, because, you know, what it, we used to mean being a cartoonist meant you had the punt, the buildup and the punchline. Yeah. Or it was a gag. Yeah, like a daily gag, yeah. Or it was a single panel, but it had to be kind of funny. And I'm not really good at that. Uh -huh. And so I'm lucky that this sort of more literary form of comics came along where you could write about serious stuff and it didn't have to be ha 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 ha. Yeah. So that's that. I was trying to be gag funny with Madame X, and uh, eh, it didn't yeah, didn't I, quite. Didn't, I, I like didn't it quite in work. that. I like it in that there was a mix of like the '50s Planet X concept with prostitution. Like that's an interesting merge of uh, two different things. So I liked it in that sense. But your autobiographical stuff is really compelling. I mean, and the way you use the Cubist stuff to illustrate like an intense emotion of that moment. Um, it's, it, it really describes it um, really well. I, uh, I like that. It, it, it appeals to the way I, I think actually. So, and I think it's good for dyslexics who read comics because they get what you're getting at too. <laughs> um, oh yeah. I mean, how many times can you put boing? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. This is like a, a more interesting version of that in a way. Um, so then, uh, so what will, do you have any particular favorite of yours from the stuff that you had in Weirdo? Oh yeah, uh, my favorite stuff was the 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 voodoo voodoo hoodoo stuff. Yeah, and and that's what kind of got me. Like it took me a while to find out what I wanted to do, and somebody one day said, "Well, have you read Zora Neale Hurston?" Yeah, and I go, yeah. "No, who the hell is she?" Well, he already knew, he was a old boyfriend of mine and he knew I was into blues and jazz and stuff and he goes oh god you got to read some of the stuff it'd be perfect for your artwork right like, don't I have nice friends they're already, already directing me to these places to go to and so I took it as his advice and I read her books and I went oh my god this is comic gold this is this is, you know because I always wondered what the black cat bone was and I always wondered yeah. what the mojo hand was and here here it was so that's why my first comic was hoodoo there was this uh, adapting her stories into comic form 
Uh-huh. And then after I read Death Tracks on the Road, I go, well, hell, my life's, I, I, yeah, I can write about my life. I mean, she, you know, she was born in a little town. Father was a mayor. And she, she became a writer. Well, that's not very interesting. And it's, you know, it, it's a summary. It's kind of, yeah, a lot of people do that. Yeah. It's the way you tell the story. And I learned that from Zora. Uh-huh. Oh, that's and great. We, and so I, I like the, the Black Cat Bone. I think that's my favorite one. Oh, actually, no. My favorite one in Weirdo was uh, tur- um, uh, Turn Off That Jungle Music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I read that. I, I, I actually looked through that one last night as well, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's interesting because it shows almost like um, kind of like having uh, racist family members, but then growing up and like being almost like confused and turned off by that. It, it's it's in, in, in the cultural, um, some of the cultural clashes that happen there. Well, it, because my grandmother lived uh, 42nd and Danker off, off uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard, mm-hmm. which was... Uh, Santa Barbara Avenue when I was a child mm-hmm. and she was the last white lady in that neighborhood and she was like the driving Miss Daisy gal because the guy across the street would get her to get her hair done take her to oh, get her I hair see. done every Thursday yeah and then uh she uh she lived by herself but my when my grandfather was alive see he's part Portuguese so he was dark yeah and he worked down at Chinatown and so he he got along with everybody and and because he was you know half portuguese so he was he he just he, the neighbors loved him and then she she'd stayed there until she died in 1978 um so when i was a little kid it was pretty racially mixed and then there was the white flight and then the blacks moved in and apparently there was a black flight and then yeah. the hispanic people moved in and now the whole area has become gentrified i looked it on google earth i just about died yeah it's it's all white people again oh interesting oh my god well there used to be a cadillac in every driveway and now there's a a motor home (laughs) yeah it's a different kind of yeah i see what you mean anyway i i just you know grew up hearing the the music next door the i go over there and i go who's that playing they go oh that's ray charles why do you like that music child i go i like it they go no i don't know you should be listening to that and my mom would go get over here leave the neighbors alone (laughs) So I was fascinated by the black neighbors because they just, yeah. they're, they cook food all day and everybody always seemed to be, you know, having a party. And I know it sounds stereotypical, but that's just the way it was. And, and the ladies wore hats that walked down the street. It was like a different world because uh-huh. we were living in West Covina and nothing's wider than West Covina. I'll hear tell you that. Yeah. Oh. And um, so it was, yeah. a, a, I think I was really fortunate um in fact when my grandmother died i had to clean up her house and she'd lived there since 1922 and she never threw, threw anything away and so i was out there loading my car and these guys are coming down the street and they're like totally you can tell they're high on something <laughs> and i see and they're coming right towards me and the neighbors are opening the windows and they thought there's going to be a, you know a problem and this guy comes up to me and it was a little kid that i used to play with and he's all grown up and he was Ah, he was so wasted. He's going, Mary, what's going on? So we had a a nice reunion, but you know, we were from two different worlds right. at that point. Right. Yes, that happens. Yeah. That happens. Yeah. As, the, as the tree branch uh grows, uh things differ. The fruit changes in a way. Um Yeah, so- well, my mom was embarrassed to be from that neighborhood. She was a kind of a snob. Yeah. And yeah. and and the people that lived there were good people. You know, uh the lady Cross the street, took my brother and I to a Baptist church uh, at the event one one weekend, mm-hmm. where they were speaking in tongues and they had the band and the organ player and it was yeah. the most. And we were the only two white kids in there, <laughs> and it was fantastic. It was the most yeah. amazing thing I'd ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah, sure, definitely more lively and interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, but the point was we were welcome. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That is that is, that is a good point. You're right. Um, now, on another related subject, when did you start going to the San Diego Comic Con, and and what was it like? It was like the early '80s, is that right? Like eighty eighty one, or when was that? Nineteen eighty six. I 86. went with Dennis. Okay. Yeah, I went with Dennis Warden. It cost seven dollars and fifty cents to get in. <laughs> uh-huh. There was plenty of parking. We we only had to park like two blocks away. Oh, cool. 
And then they had this real long table where you had to fill out all these forms. And it was, it, that took about 15 minutes. Uh-huh. In fact, I did a comic strip about when Stick Boy and Mary go to the Comic Con. Mm-hmm. And um, at first I was like bored. I was like, oh God, it's nothing but superheroes. Superheroes. But then we found, yeah, we found Ron Turner's table. There you and go. we met Peter Bag. It yeah. was like, wow. So we, we, we stayed four hours and I, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, Dennis, I want to go home. And he's going, ah, you lightweight. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next year, that's when we, I met Dory Sita and Christine Critter and all the girls from San Francisco. And Lux Interior was there with Ivy. Yes. And Mojo Nixon. It was like going, hey, this is this is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole nother other universe at Comic Con there. You're right. That a lot of the the superhero fanboys might not necessarily even know about. Well, they didn't think much of us because they right where Ron Turner was, he had his table, and then there was Bob Crabb and Kika and Don Donahue and Dory. And there was three tables and that was it. Yeah. Of, of people that we could relate to. And then by the third year we shared a table way in the back and, and that was kind of fun. But I think it was only three years at Second and B, and then they moved to uh, Harbor. Harbor yeah, I Drive. see. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, and I would say the '90s, which Jim is going to um, take us into. But I would say the '90s, they start celebrating more underground stuff at or independent stuff, I guess, um, at Comic Con, where where that stuff becomes more um, inflamed and more of a presence. Uh, definitely in the '90s, for sure, it becomes almost like another another under undercurrent mainstream. I would say, but. Um, all right, Jim, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, let's let's stay in the 80s just for a minute, because in 85, 86, I think for a lot of comic book people, they think of it as, oh, that's when um, Dark Knight and Watchmen came out. And yeah. <laughs> maybe, they'll, maybe they'll add, oh, yeah, and um, that, that mouse thing, uh, mouse came out, and that was that was it. And then you just have everything else. And it's such a misunderstanding of that last half of that decade when when you're emerging and so many people are doing such interesting work and such interesting publications and i so i kind of want to go through that to remind listeners that there's there's a whole world out there as we're saying that isn't marvel and isn't dc and and you were a big part of that uh you and everybody you know were were a big big aspect of that um so besides weirdo uh, you were also working, you had started working, uh, doing stuff for women's comics as well, right? Yeah, well, well, let's back up a little bit because, you know, all of us knew we couldn't work for DC and, and, and Marvel. We didn't have those right. kind of chops. And, uh, and those guys could draw. I mean, I didn't like the books, but I've kind of changed my mind over the years. I was being a, you know, smart ass back then, Jack Kirby, I don't like him. Well, you know what? I was wrong. And, but two things happen, mini comics and anthologies. Yeah. And the anthologies was a way for all of us to get published because nobody else would have us. And nobody at that point, you know, nobody had any ideas for superheroes and that's all the big two wanted. They wanted uh, this man or that man. And then the mini comics, that was self-publishing. So everybody kind of met through that, that area. And yeah, the anthologies, there was women's comics, tits and clits, rip off press, buzzard, uh, centrifugal bumble puppy. Um, oh God, prime cuts, fan graphics, uh, snarf, uh, even critters, it, which was funny animals. And I'm, I know I'm leaving out a, a, a whole bunch of them, um, but yeah, you know, like when drawn and quarterly came, they had their first uh, anthology magazine diamond wouldn't carry it they said it wasn't good enough so same thing happened right. to top shelf too and i said i told brett i said just keep going don't listen to these guys keep keep it up keep going keep going and so uh we all had to we had to scramble but uh i don't know the anthologies were they didn't sell very well but they were at least a way to get published now women's comics was was weird because I'd heard about women's comics and I just sent a letter up to last gasp going, what's this women's comics, blah, blah, blah. And three years passed. And then I got a letter from Joyce Farmer because they had, I think 
I think women's comics went through a period where it wasn't printed because there was a lot of infighting and nobody could get along and all this crap. You've heard that right. story. Yeah. So Joyce calls me out of the blue and um, I said, okay, I'll do Madam X for you. And she lived in Laguna Beach. So I went up to meet her and then she told me about tits and clits, which I had never seen before. And she goes, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. And I go, ah, oh, come on, do one more issue. I'll help you edit it. Come on, come on. I was hungry. And so that's how I met Joyce and we got involved in that and we're friends to this day too. So to me, it wasn't just meeting colleagues and getting published. I, I mean, I met lifelong friends. I mean, you could do, you know, I mean, we, we got a tribe. It's really, uh, we're very fortunate. I'm like, wait, so no, we go way no. He's a big hot shot now. <laughs> Love it. Let's let's talk. I was looking at that uh, comics journal cover that had all the different women, uh, little pictures of all the women on it. Uh, uh -huh. I pulled that out, uh, and and you're there, obviously. Um, let's talk about women emerging during this time. And and yes, there have been women comics before. I mean, and and Trina and all all of that. But it does seem like with the opportunity to do these things in the '80s with the anthology books, it really takes off. And you have people like uh, Julie Doucet, who I love, and and um, uh, later uh, people like Renee French, and just everywhere, and all the ones that that follow in the autobiographical stuff. Can you talk about some of that as a as a as a movement, and and how people you you guys were working together to some degree? I mean, you you were connected. Well, the women's comic. It's funny because there was women's comics up in San Francisco and Tits and Clits down Laguna Beach. And they were at one point didn't know that there were two groups of people doing the exact same thing. And I thought the early women's comics had a little bit of forced feminism to them. It was a little preachy. It didn't really speak to me, whereas Tits and Clits really did speak to me because it's like women, you know, we, we, we have to deal with consequences. I mean, pretty heavy duty consequences with sex. So that, that was something I could relate to. Uh, the thing about women's in San Francisco, you had to be, you had to go to meetings. I guess they had all these meetings and everything. And I, and I thought that was a little, <laughs> I didn't like that. And then friends of Lulu came along and it seemed like a bunch of women with a chip on their shoulder. And my attitude is just go home and draw. You know, quit, well, meetings and groups and you got to, do this and that. If, screw that. Go and draw. So when I that issue of the comics journal was number two hundred thirty seven, and I was the editor of that. I asked Kim Thompson if I could be the guest editor because I wanted to do a book about women, but without the usual. Oh, so and so told me this, and this guy wouldn't give me that job, and I was I was blah blah. blah. No, I thought, God damn it! Look at all these women doing comics. Let's show them what they are we got 60 i had 60 women do their self portraits for the front front and back cover i copied diane newman's idea for twisted sisters i'll freely admit oh it. wow yeah i remember that yeah uh -huh. and um i wanted to have articles about I, I reviewed comics and i was reviewing not just comics for girls but sex comics like some of the arrows comics and uh New people like Gabrielle Bell that nobody was paying attention to. I met her at the Comic Con. She had these little mini comics and she was so afraid and shy. And, but there was just, I just think by having those 60 women on the front and back, that, that made a statement. Oh, absolutely. And it was 10 months of work. And boy, Gary Groth and Kim Thompson, they threw me in the deep end of the pool. They didn't help me with anything. They didn't assign me any writers. I had to do it all on my own. And uh, uh, that was a lot of work, but time well spent. Now you didn't do a, you didn't do your own interview or an interview. You did a two-page um, illustration for that about girls, girls at cons, and girls in comics. But um, you 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 didn't choose to have you be one of the people that was was talking about it, did you? No. Why? I mean, I don't know. Well. The, I think I ran out of energy. <laughs> I was like, I wanted to get the damn thing done. Um, the only thing I did was that little two pager with Trina and I are having coffee. And she yeah. had done a, a book about women cartoonists, and I didn't like it. She'd left out all these people. So she goes, Well, do your own 
I wasn't going to drop the F bomb, but she said, do your own fucking book. And I go, all right, I will do my own effing book. So that's why I did the comics journal. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> treat as challenge. Oh, that's, that's what I was looking for. I wanted to hear that. That's interesting. Yeah, Trina and I, you know, she and I uh, didn't become, weren't instant friends when we met. And I did a, a strip in Weirdo making fun of her California girls. And she hated me for that. Well, we all got invited up to Northampton to the Cartoon Art Museum. And it was Marie Severin and Trina and I. And I think Marie could pick up that there's a little tension. Wow. And so we just, we hung out for the whole weekend. At the end of the weekend, it was like, you know, you're not, you're not too bad. And Latrina said, yeah, you know, you're okay. And now I consider her one of my closest friends. And we've spent the last two comic fests down here in Kearney Mesa. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, next to each other. We've had, we've had the best time. We have, we have a lot in common. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, she's mellowed with age. Of course, we still argue about the Zap Comics guys. She thinks they, they all like, they all idolized Charlie Manson. And I'm like going, oh, you are so <laughs> off base about that. They hated the hippies, yeah. especially Spain. And she goes, okay, I'll agree with that. Spain, he was the one. He didn't like, he didn't like Charlie Manson. But she's convinced that they all thought he was the greatest. Uh, I don't know where that com that's coming from. That's fascinating. Yeah, because she, she almost doesn't, she doesn't like the, um, she doesn't even want to be called an underground artist because she, she of the, how she feels about those the artist from from the Zap comics. Well, she started writing, and as a researcher and, and a person who writes documentary type style books, she's very good. Uh, the book she wrote, Last Girl Standing, uh, is her her biography, and she, oh, we read it. Yeah, she she got treated pretty treated pretty badly. I mean, I, mean, I wouldn't have put up with that crap. And, well, because uh, that's we a common to... story, though, isn't it? For women in in comics, there's there's always they're going to run into that kind of mistreatment uh, uh, more in those days, I I, I hope than than today. Um, Never, but that's a me. good seg. But well, you know, because you know, I, I remember because Jim asked Trina about that. Have you have you had faced flack like that? But she said no. But 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 you're saying she did. Well, she's talking about those parties where Roger Brand would take the guys in the other room and they talk about yeah. art. She'd go in there and then yeah, they all she get did. up That's and right. leave. And, That's true. Yeah, she did tell us about that, yeah. I have never encountered one sexist anything in the comic business ever. Maybe one time at the Comic-Con, I was reaching up to grab something and one of the old guys said, hey, nice leg. Well, that's not uh, something that affects my job or anything. That was just a kind of a, you know a caveman comment which is fine i don't care but no i the man have treated me i've never had any problems none in, in fact it was an advantage by the time i kind of seemed to be a woman that's cool so so that that really opens it up for me to ask you about in this period in the beginning of the 80s through the mid 90s who were the real heroes in terms of of the publishers and maybe some of the the artists in terms of of helping uh, women get get noticed and and really emerge as a more of a force in comics than they were uh, when Trina was breaking in. Um, Ron, who, Ron which Turner. publishers? Yeah. Oh yeah, Ron Turner. I mean, Ron Turner published "It Ain't Me, Babe." Uh, he he published "Women's." Uh, they published "Tits and Clips." Um, uh, he uh, you know published Dory Cetus solo book. Uh, no, Ron Ron was terrific. Um, I'm trying to think of someone else. Uh, oh, the, uh, Kathy and Fred Todd from Rip Off Press. When they had okay. their anthologies, they they uh, had a, a good balance of people. But once again, they used the kind of art they liked. You know, they there wasn't a there wasn't a you know I, I did I I guess the closest to sexism I've had people ask me they want me to be in a book because they need a woman, but I wouldn't call that sexist at all. Uh, but anyway, I don't know. It just seemed like there was a, all of a sudden, women, more women were doing comics and they had a chance to be published. And thanks to people like the Todds and Turner and Dennis Kitchen, of course, was. Uh, I, I was going to, I was waiting for you to say Dennis Kitchen because he published Twisted Sisters, right? Yes, he did. And he's a, a good cartoonist in his own right, too. Talk about Twisted Sisters. 
Well, a couple panels that I'd been with Diane, the one criticism was, where were the gay women cartoonists? And Diane said, well, I only use work by women I liked, and I didn't ask them who they slept with, but a glaring omission was Alison Bechtel. And I didn't oh, yeah. know about her because she was only in The Advocate. And then when I discovered her, I think that like two years after Twisted Sisters, I was like, oh my God. Oh my God, this is just, you know, dykes to watch out for. It was fantastic. And, and, um, and, but I think even though Diane lived in San Francisco, you know, advocates were, you know, where could you find them? They'd be in front of bars or on the in bookstores or things like that. It's not like something that you, I don't know. I, I don't think Diane was aware of her work. Anyway, I just uh, thought, uh, what she did was groundbreaking because the work was just so good, but it's just such a variety of styles. Carol Masoyevich, oh my God, I love her work. And she's just, I guess she's just decided comics aren't for her and I don't know what she's doing now. So that was tragic. Oh, oh that's a shame because that, that, that's some of that stuff uh, is just amazing and nothing, nothing like it. I mean, it looks like those early woodcuts from a long time ago but with such power i i love her stuff yeah yeah the first time i saw her stuff was in uh was in weirdo and i think denny eichhorn wrote the story i'm not sure but anyway yeah there's another guy denny eichhorn doing real stuff hell he had more women in those issues than men and and uh he he discovered people like holly tuttle and um penny van horn no penny was in twisted sisters but yeah, Penny Van Horn, she just, with her scratchboard style. I mean, she just came out of Texas. It was incredible. Around in the, the late 80s, you were also doing stuff for uh, some of the magazines like Hustler and Screw as well, right? Was that a money uh, thing to pay bills? No, I loved being in Hustler. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> I, oh, I, I, no, I, uh, because of my dad's interest in Playboy, I used to go. read Playboy. And what I was interested in is the stuff that, that Hugh Hefner published about our civil rights. Right. And he had That's a lot true. of articles about people being set up by the post office, to have pornography mailed to their house. And they're, then they're looking at 10 years in prison. Right. He, had, he, he was the first guy to publish Alex Haley's uh, book, Roots, selection, you know, sure. chapters from his book. So... I felt Larry Flint had every right to do Hustler. I mean, he took a bullet for it, you know? And I yeah. voted for him when he ran for governor of California. Not yeah. just because I worked for Hustler, because I don't think there's anything wrong with pinup art, centerfold art. I don't think there's anything wrong with these women. If they want to pose naked, do it while you got that body, honey. <laughs> you can't yeah. do it when you get older. Yeah, that's and cool. The but the pay was fantastic. And my husband had been laid off from Teledyne Ryan and they laid off 200 people one day. And so I started getting work, 1500 bucks for a two page spread, if you'll pardon the expression. Uh -huh. And uh, spread, it, it, yes. it got us through. And uh, I don't, I didn't do anything for screw. I think I had one cot, one little illustration of screw. I don't remember really. Yeah. And, uh, then I think after about a year and a half, uh, like guys like Kozak and Piz and, and Coop were doing stuff for Hustler. And I apparently, according to Bob Nelson or Bill Nelson, who was the art editor, Larry started going, hey, I don't know. This art looks kind of weird in here. We yeah, have more naked women. Eh, yeah, I don't know if I like it. So that kind of, I don't know if they still use underground artists in there or not. I mean, it's not exactly the kind of magazine. I, I mean, I don't buy my buying a Playboy, but asking a guy for a hustler at Seven Eleven is a little. <laughs> I think I, I, I guess I could do it, but <laughs> yeah, I feel uncomfortable. Anyway, all my friends were buying Hustler, saying that, oh yeah, we went to see your art, Mary. And I'm like, That's oh, cool. yeah, right, sure you did, sure you did. But yeah, I think um, it's so, it's so, funny you mentioned about like the dad having the nudie magazines and it being an influence uh, uh, because. Frank Thorne is, 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 you know, I try to get patterns between artists, but yeah, Frank Thorne said that his dad had magazines like that. And then it totally like, it kind of 
that was his uh, one of the, the formative things. So that's interesting that 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 was kind of formative for you as well. Uh, just that your dad was looking at that stuff. Well, yeah. Well, the other the, well, the see what really happened to me is uh, I think it was in the third grade, and I was taking piano lessons, and I didn't like them very well. And there was a little shack in the backyard, and the lady said, "Go out there and play." So I went out there, and there was a, there was like a hundred playboys. And I'd never seen them before. And like I said, naked ladies, big deal. But it was the cartoony. It was a beautiful artwork, like full pages. of. I could tell it was watercolor. But at that age, I was going, what are all these jokes about bedrooms? I don't get it. What's with all the beds? <laughs> and uh, But the art was just what, what blew me away. Every one of those cartoons, they could do ink washes at the I, I, you could just stare at them forever, even though you didn't get the gag. And my favorite one, of course, was Gan Wilson because mm-hmm. I like monsters. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So, so that was That's a bit. I, I, I can't believe anybody could say they looked at Playboy when they're a kid and not say they were influenced by the the comics and the cartoons in there. Yeah, yeah, I like that stuff. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, do, how do you feel about Gloria Steinem? I like her. Cool. I don't know. She was a Playboy bunny at one time. I think that was kind of cool. Mm. Um, I avoided a lot of that kind of reading about those po- political books and feminist books. I don't think I've ever read one feminist book. I was more reading books like Black Like Me and Autobiography of Malcolm X mm-hmm. and James Baldwin and Zara Neale and that kind of stuff. Mm. The feminist thing, um, I just think People should get paid equally. That's about right. all. That's where I. That's stand. your main. That's your main thing. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the autobiographical stuff that was getting published, um, uh, both in 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 later in the life of the party um, trade, and and also in in Slutburger. Um, that became a major focus of your your work at at, at some point. Uh, can you talk about what it was like putting that in on paper like that, and how you did it, and why you did it, and um, uh, the influences and everything about that? Well, it's something I've been doing a long time is telling party stories. Like you go to a party and and um, let's say you got pulled over by the cop and you got a ticket, and, you know, he tore your car apart and and uh, you. He didn't find your pot or something. Uh, you know, you get to a party and you have a few drinks, smoke a little weed. You start telling the story, start embellishing it and kind of start making light of it and kind of laughing with relief that you got away with it. And, and you can really, you know, you can really work a room with a story, something like that. And so I've always liked to sure. do that and um, sort of, you know, Was like Howard like Cruz tell- uh, influence. Howard Cruz, oh my God, I, I have a pile of books here. I wasn't sure if we were going to be video or not. And on the very top is Stuck Rubber Baby. I think that book should yeah. be required reading for every teenager in North America. Why don't, you show, why don't you show the, the cover real quick since we have some video going. Do Maybe you? We, we, might, we might use some, we'll see. Oh my God, well, here it is. Yeah, there you go. Nice, Stuck Rubber Baby. Yep. And I my, my copy's six feet away. I could pull it out too. It's 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 great. Yeah, the uh, page where there uh, where uh, the kid that gets lynched, he's making them a casserole, uh-huh. and they're all in the kitchen about ready to eat. And her, and Tolan's brother-in-law goes, "The rhombus, ain't that the gay bar?" <laughs> and everybody gives it this look like, "Uh, I own that page." <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And Howard was selling them for only. Oh, do you two. really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and he was. I, I'm not, not sure what page number that is, but he was selling these pages for two hundred dollars, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" Oh boy. And I wish I'd had some more money. I would have gotten five pages, but yeah, he, uh, he's, he's, he's just. I, I never got to meet him either, unfortunately. Hmm. So anyway, back to autobiographical stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, I always had a rule that when I was doing stories about people, I would change their name and change their appearance because I don't want to get sued, you know. And um, so that was kind of a little rule that I did. But after that, I just wanted to tell the truth about what happened. 
So like uh, Burt Reynolds with a plunger up his butt, you'd change the face, maybe, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd change the face on that one. I'd, <laughs> I'd give him a beard. He'd have a beard and blonde hair. Oh, that's a good. Plunger. Yeah. Right, that's a good. plunger. With maybe a cubist um, during a certain moment of that. Yeah, that's gotcha. right. Yeah, with the, the, the happy, <laughs> what do you call it? The, uh, the, uh, that, when, it, when it gets happy. Well, I had to do that for drawing power. And because the, the friend that betrays me at the end is a little rich kid uh-huh. and he's a prick. And had I used his name and, and, and his real identity, like obviously in the story, the guitar player is not the guitar player. In real life, he was a different player i don't want to say anymore and um oh so you have to be so it's not careful. kenny kenny's name is not kenny and kenny uh no i can't i can't talk about this about who he really is because it for two okay. reasons i hate i hate his guts and secondly i don't want to give him any legitimacy to who he is and the guy that did dose me was a really creepy guy i was hoping i could have one more page because that guy, even though after I moved here, he called me out of the blue and he starts stalking me over the phone and saying, remember that time I raped you and all this stuff. Ew. And so finally I found out he had a child. So I told him, all right, next time you call me, I'm calling Child Protective Services. And then you can tell them why you're so bored that you have to call me all the time. And that was the end of that. That and took that care was of, the end that. of that. Wow, that's crazy. That's a horrible thing. Yeah, well, I was, I was, you know, he wanted to come down and see me. And I said, really, you want to come down and see me? Well, I got a 38 oh, Smith & Wesson man. I'd like to show you. It's crazy. And I am a gun owner. Wow. So. Mm-hmm. Yes, Good. but but you don't like it, right? I mean, I read where you, you bought the gun, but you, you're not loving having the gun, right? Well, I'm, I'm probably going to get rid of it. Uh, uh, my mom is still alive, and uh, she's going to be 99 in January and so all these these things that I have belong to my father and they're technically hers but when the time comes when she passes I plan to sell everything um yeah I did a story in Hotwire called The Judge yeah and that's right you know I was always anti-gun because they only serve one purpose but when you have somebody trying to break into your house and trying to break the window to your bedroom it kind of changes your outlook on life a little it bit. It does. And, yeah. and I had a knee jerk reaction. And uh, I did, I had always wanted to shoot because I was, I liked archery and I wanted to see if I could, you know, if I would be a sharpshooter. And I was, they gave me the target to take home. <laughs> so uh, next time we go on vacation, I said to Paul, we should put the target in our window. <laughs> so if people come up and they're thinking about robbing our house, they might think twice. But no, it's a horrible thing. When you go to shooting ranges, the smoke smells horrible. The noise, it was like makes you jump every time you hear it. And then you're, it's like a bowling alley. So you're standing in line with all these people with guns. Uh, I'm not going to do that again. Uh-huh. I mean, what's to stop somebody from flipping out? You know? Anyway, so I had fun I doing wa- that story. Huh? I want to go through some things that don't get talked about in some of the interviews with you and just throw some things out um, Yay! Um, sort of okay. all over the place. So uh, the AIDS Memorial Quilt, you did, a, you did a, a bit on that, right? Talk about that. I haven't read anything about that. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I did uh, the quilt for my friend Brett Scrivener who uh, actually grew up with my husband in Torrance. Uh, my husband was his family's paper boy. And they went to the same high school. They went to North High. And Brent was a genius. He, uh, he made a robot in high school. And he was the guy that designed the Devo flower pot hats and the Freedom from uh-huh. Choice wigs. He also did the PDK meter in Ghostbusters. Is that what it's called? And he did uh, props for Battle Beyond the Stars. And he, be, I mean, he started becoming really, really famous. He worked for Modern Props up in Venice. Uh-huh. But he was gay, and he had to keep it a secret from Hollywood. And so uh, he died of AIDS, and um, he was my best male friend. And um, I had to call it when I after he died they were going to throw out all the Devo hats he had an apartment down in Torrance so I had to call up Mark Mothersbaugh and tell him you better run down to that dumpster and get those hats or they're going to you know go in a landfill and none of them knew 
that he was gay. They were totally shocked. And so when the uh, names project idea came up, I, I said, oh, no, I have to be the one. I have to be the one. I've got four yards of denim at home because denim, right? The guys, because the clones always wear denim and plaid shirts. And then I painted it with acrylic paint and it took me about, boy, it took about three months to paint that thing because it's, uh, I think, four by eight feet. That's a big piece of fabric. And then uh, I was able to get pictures of him like uh, uh, on, on fabric, you know, because uh, I went to put a picture of him on the, on the piece. And these people in the local store, they did, they did that for me for free because it was an AIDS victim. And then um, when I got the panel done, I sent it to his mom and then they put all the sequins on it and all the little, so everybody, everybody contributed it. And it's a beautiful, I think it's the most beautiful piece in the whole um, uh, panels of all the panels. And I also think that the Names Project is the most important piece of folk art of the 21st century. I don't know if have you ever seen the whole thing laid out? No. It's powerful. No, I have. You got to bring you bring Kleenex. <laughs> you bring a lot of Kleenex. Anyway, it made his mother and his Could father very happy. And now they're coming out with a new Ghostbusters. And so his nephew had wrote an article about Brent for some trade magazine which makes me very happy. So he he you know, he he should not be forgotten. Can can you send us a picture of that that we could put on comic book historians, or maybe on the promotion of this? I'd I'd love to have that seen if it's possible. I have yeah I have a picture. It's not a very good one because it was taken in '92 by his parents and they didn't have a digital camera. But you can see it well enough to see it. it you know it's kind of off center and it's it's a little out of out of focus. But I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. I I'd love I'd love to see that. Um, okay, my next, well, you know my next question. It? Wait, I, I can tell you how you see it. If you Google yeah. Names Project AIDS Quilt Name Search. So if you go to that and find the, 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 the search part, just type in Brent Scrivener, S-C-R-I-V-N-E-R. And they sew okay. six, of, six of them at a time but at least you'll be able to see, it's one of the panels, so you'll be able to see it. That's great. All right, yeah. my, my next question for you was, why do you like comic book people and cartoonists so much more than you do fine artists? <laughs> you must have read my interview in Comic Book Creator, didn't you? <laughs> um, yes. Okay. I don't know what the hell is wrong with artists. They are, I guess, because they're not writers for the most part. All I know is I, uh, art and I are, ha are having a separation right now. I'm not enough of an asshole to be in the art world. I can't make that small talk at those openings. I can't go to any more openings. I can't, I mean, I just can't do it. They're the most vapid. I mean, they won't even talk about their famous artists, favorite artists. I mean, it's, 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 they're like savants across the board. Oh, there's a few exceptions. Robert Williams is very eloquent. He's got good vocabulary. He's smart. He's funny. Uh, Anthony Osgang, he was a funny guy. Piz was a, a really funny guy. Uh, the lowbrow guys are, and the tiki people are cool. Okay, so in our world, you got the tiki people and the lowbrow people. They're okay. Most of them. But everyone the comic book people... I don't know. They just say that we all just, you know, we're geeks and we know it and we kind of revel in our geekdom. Like, like we never fit in in high school. I mean, I was never a hipster and most cartoonists, like most of the guys like Noah Van Skyver and Pete Bag, they wear old man's clothes. They wear like little check shirts or total squares, but they, they've got something to say. And it, it's a, a real dichotomy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, I read that and it spoke to me because I've I've divorced fine artists and I know that <laughs> crowd. And I I yeah. much prefer the, the comic book people as well. Um, I the a a similar question. Why do you hate Los Angeles so much? <laughs> I got a right. God damn it. Oh, I don't know. It just. Maybe because I spent half my life driving, 
And that's all I did was drive <laughs> to get from one spot to another. I mean, my parents lived over by San Peter, and I used to drive all the way to Cal State Long Beach every day, you know, without batting an eye. Or I used to live in Long Beach, and I worked up in Hollywood. I drive up there, you know, but it only took forty-five minutes to drive there. But just, uh, I just, uh, my whole goal was just to get out of there. Um, the air. The, 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 we, we, lived, and we lived in Redondo Beach when we moved in 1981. There was never any blue sky. I think it was just the crime in our area. Of course, there's crime everywhere, right? You know, but I, uh, I, I don't like the traffic. I don't like the cars. I don't, it's just, it's, it's gotten uglier and uglier. And uh, it, it, uh, it kind of reminds me of, uh, the medieval ages with so many homeless people. I mean, uh, a few years ago, I saw this guy walking down Sunset and he's missing a foot. I go, oh boy, <laughs> you know. That sounds awful. I mean, well, who, knows what, who knows what happened to that? And we might need you to draw a story of the origin of that <laughs> well, lack of a foot. Okay, so, since my grandfather worked for the health department, his beat was Chinatown. There's always been bums in LA. There's always been bums. Eh? Say Alavera Street over Exposition sure. Park. My grandmother used to give people a dollar to buy peanuts. There's always been that, you know, Skid Row and all that. But, you know, LA, when I was a kid, the smog was even worse then. You would read about people dying on the streets weekly in 1961. Oh, yeah. So when we came back to the United States, I was all excited. All right, I'm going back to LA. Yeah, LA, LA. So for many years, I loved LA. I used to, you know, go to all the concerts, go to the whiskey, you know, all the Starwood. I mean, you, you could drive up there in a half an hour. But those days are gone. So it's just a combination of things, Alex, you know. And then... Um... I wanted to ask you about, you had mentioned that you, you weren't comfortable with single panel cartoons, but you did quite a few of them um, for the, uh, the Coast News in Encinitas, right? The, um, the, the less you know, the better strip? Well, those, those weren't really so much gags. They were kind of, I was basing, my influence was uh, kind of like they'll do it every time or Ripley's Believe It or Not. So, and right. they were political in nature. So um, the ones where I really took the dagger and stuck them in were for our city council. And I took great delight in doing that. But I researched a lot of facts about politics and housing. And, and I went to hundreds of city council meetings. So I'd have like, even if you didn't like my cartoon, you couldn't argue with the facts. And then I started doing slice of life things like, you know, rescuing a, a snake in the backyard. It got stuck in the fence. And then I research the snake and throw a little biology in there and stuff. So they weren't exactly funny, ha ha, like, you know, the stuff you read in the newspaper. How long did more, you do those? Uh, well, the first time I did it for a, a newspaper called the Surf City Times, and I did a, uh, a grid, uh, like a, a horizontal uh, uh, six to nine grid thing. And then with the, uh, the less you know, the better you feel. That was single panel, but sometimes I divide that up into four panels. So the first time was a, about a year. And then I did the single panel, less you know, better you feel for two and a half years. And 44 of those weeks, I worked for free because I didn't th think it was fair for the, pu the publisher to pay me because I didn't know what I was doing. It was a brand new thing for me. I'd never done pol political cartoons. And I felt so strongly about some of the issues here in town. I figured instead of going to the meetings, I'll do it through the paper. And we did stop a few things with those cartoons. I, I don't want to take credit, but they were, some of them were very, some of the issues were stopped dead in their tracks thanks to those cartoons. So I, I did, I, 60% of the time I was successful, 40% of the time I, I, uh, I don't think people knew what, what I was talking about. But it was and a good we'll, experiment. we'll never see those, will we? I mean, those will never be collected or anything. There's just no way to actually look at those as, as a piece of Mary Fleener. Not unless you order them from me, because I put them in little books. 
you know. Oh. But yeah, I, I, I self-published. Oh, I'm still making mini comics after all these years. <laughs> And, uh, well, I know yeah. you you are a publisher. And oh, you know, and I forgot to mention we were talking about your things, but uh Bongo also uh published uh Fleener. Yeah. So we should mention we should mention Bongo comics uh oh, going I guess back we to... have to. <laughs> well, it was uh I was doing the last issue of Slut Burger and I was really tired of dealing with drawn and quarterly because I had to mail the artwork to Canada. And that was a pain in the neck. Oh my God, you had to pack it right. If I, if I declared a value on the artwork, Chris Oliveras got a, 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 a fee where he had to pay the border people some sort of, uh, uh, oh, what, would you, what do you call it? A, a, a levy or a tax or something like that. And, uh, that was about the time too. I was getting lots of illustration work. My husband had been laid off work. I, I couldn't do two issues of Slut Burger a year and Chris couldn't understand that. So he was getting sick of me and I was getting sick of him. So Matt Groening, see Matt Groening's friend, Millie Smythe, who does his merchandising said, hey, Matt wants to do a line of underground comics with you and Gary Panner. But it has oh. to be all ages. So once again, I'm like going all ages. <laughs> How do you hmm. do that? And I said, well, I, I think I could do that. I think I could make something weird and, and leave out the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And, and I was into that tiki stuff. So that's why the first issue was a tiki thing. And I thought, you know what? I'll do a comic with no words. Because I love Lynn Ward. And I love Eric Duker. Yeah. I love his stuff. Oh, yeah. But Lynn Ward, uh, In God's Man, In God's Eye, or God's Man, I think that's the name of it. What, what a book. What a hell of a book. So, um. I'm all eager beaver and okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Well, I didn't realize that Matt's company was in terms of structure and bureaucracy is right up there with DC and Marvel. Straight arrows. Uh, everything was strictly oh, business. And uh, the first time I met the crew was at Comic Con and everybody was wearing suits and ties and gals wearing little dresses and I'm going this is not like last gasp or rip off press <laughs> <laughs> and so I did the first uh, Fleener and the, oh yeah the name Fleener I thought that was the stupidest idea I ever heard Matt's going oh no you got a weird <laughs> name we should do it and his lawyer is going no it's a perfect name it's funny and I'm going no it's not it's conceited well there's a comic called Jim I'm going yeah but that's that's different than the we should have called it Mary not Fleener <laughs> But I figured, well, they know more than I do. Matt's, you know, he's a multimillionaire. What am I, right? So I went along with it. Lesson number one, listen to your gut. Never do what everybody tells you. So I learned about that. So when I got the first one done, I drove all the way from Culver City, which from down here is at least a two and a half hour drive. Sure. And I brought my art. I put my art in a pizza box because I thought it'd be funny to go into one of these towers at Century City holding a pizza box. I just wanted to do something different. Actually, I mailed uh, some artwork to rip off press once and I wrapped it in Christmas paper. So I always, yeah, I like to do some weird shit. So when I'm in the elevator going up to these offices up on the 16th floor, all these people are looking down at all these yuppies and Wall Street people like, oh, there's a pizza delivery girl. So I walk into Bongo, <laughs> bring the pizza in, and they'll go, you brought us lunch. I go, no, I didn't. I brought you comics, you jerks. <laughs> what is this? So they go, okay, thanks. And I'm like, okay, can I hang out? Are we going to lunch? And they're like, goodbye. And I'm like, and that was I it. Just, I just drove two and a half F an hours to get up here and now I'm being dismissed. And that didn't go over well with me. Then they assigned me an editor. And I won't mention his name because uh, I'm, I'm not. Anyway, I was, I was assigned an editor, and he was like this eager beaver, little puppy dog, calling me up, trying to get me to hack out a comic. And I said, I don't roll like that. So I did two more issues. And the problem, from what I understand, is Gary Panter's comic, Jimbo, was misinterpreted by the retailers. They thought it was a Simpsons character. So they ordered all of his comics, and when they got them, <laughs> they were like, what's this? You know, this guy looks like he drew it with his foot. 
And then that, that sort of... Maybe that's the same foot that the other guy lost. Yeah. <laughs> the plot so, thickens uh, with this foot. Yeah, the plot thickens. So, and then when my book came out, I, I was stuck with, a, you know, Mary, the, the person does autobiographical comics. And it is, it is true when you are stuck with a brand and people expect something from you, they're very narrow-minded about what you want to do. So, uh, by the third issue, the, the, the initial orders were so pathetic, I said, I'm not going to waste Matt's money, Matt's time, and more importantly, my time. So, I pulled the plug on it. And... Uh, uh. I'm glad I did, but what happened out of that, somebody at Nickelodeon saw the first one and I did a little dance with them for about a year and a half, thinking I might want an animated show. And then I found out that's not what I want at all. I hate this world too. <laughs> so I, don't, you know, I, I, I take risks, I take risks and I give 150%, but there comes a point if it ain't working, I walk away. And a lot of people, they think that's being harsh, but I'm just saving everybody time, you know? So anyway, a couple of, I was, I was going to say, I was going to move on to the next question I had, which was, did you, did you meet, did you know Harvey P. Carr? No. Cause uh, I, I have your, the beats where you did a story in that. And I thought it was great work. I really enjoyed that particular piece. Do you recall doing that one? Oh, I, I really, I, 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 I tried real, real hard with that one, because um, it, it shows. Had, it's a really good. It's a really, really good piece of your work. I like it a lot. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, Diane Dupree is still very much alive, and she's into astrology and tarot and witchcraft and all this. So you best believe I made that look good because I wanted to make her look good because she's a, she's a force to be reckoned with. You know, back to Harvey. I only met him once and that's when he was really sick and he was at comic con and that was during that our cancer year and he was just he was just a mess and he was sitting at the tundra table and he would he'd just start break down and crying in tears oh and then 15 minutes later he'd be okay george dicaprio told me he just like went to his bathroom and curled up in the fetal position for like a day and a half he was in a really bad state i knew joyce grabner a little better and she bought one of my paintings, one of my jazz paintings for Harvey to cheer him up, which was oh, very that's nice. Great. So he has one of my paintings. So anyway, when Paul Buell got a hold of me about the beat book, about the beat book, I got a script from Harvey, and it was like eight lines. Like he was in bad shape, and he got so many things wrong. Diane DePrima did not have three children; she had five children. She had two abortions, and he just didn't do the research. So I just went. Okay, so I think I've read 50 books at least about the beatniks. I could teach a class about the beats. I, I just read everything I get my hands on. And I decided I hate Jack Cassidy. <laughs> I think he's a fucking asshole. And um, I read the books about uh, Jack, uh, Jan Kerouac and um, uh, Nobody's Wife and the, the books by the women were just as fascinating and the best book on the beats is a book about William Burroughs it's a real thick book but each chapter talks about one of the different writers at that time so that was really the best book I read and so uh, I did mail the book to Diane and I got a copy of Loba the 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 the, the wolf epic poem and a note uh -huh. that said you got it and I was so happy that I that's did her great i did her proper you know so that was a relief that i go okay she's not gonna oh that's fantastic and uh, so, goes, yeah, so for listeners i i just want to tell them what we're talking about is a book called the beats a graphic history uh with uh text by harvey p Carr, nancy j peters and uh and others um and and mary has a story in there that's that's very good and very worth checking out um, we're running low on time, so I want to go through pretty quickly. Wow, um, we are. Yeah, it, time goes by fast. Uh, that variant cover you did of Popeye uh, with the uh, Bud Sagendorf uh, reprints, that was yeah. great. Can Talk about that for a minute. Well, I worked with, with Craig Yo before. We did uh, something for the Art of Mickey Mouse. 
uh, which, by the way, was another work for hire. I've done three work for hires, uh, the Grateful Dead, Mickey Mouse, and Big Book of Wild Women. But I got the rights back to that. But we don't, we'll, we don't have time to talk about that. Anyway, yeah, Craig called me up and said, you want to do Popeye? And I go, you bet. So um, I, I, the first idea I submitted, they didn't like. Um, so I said, oh, let me try again. I got to do Popeye. So I did the Popeye thing, and then I really, after the book, after the comic came out, I realized I forgot to put his pipe in his mouth. <laughs> so I figured, well, he should stop smoking anyway. But yeah, I had a lot of fun doing that. That was very cool. And then um, let's talk briefly about the uh, the Kim. You're you're uh, working with Kim Munson uh, yeah. on the uh, the exhibit in New York. Let's talk about that because that's very exciting. Well, I hope. Uh, we get to, what is it, level four by October, because we, I think they've extended the show. It's it's very exciting. I mean, I I imagine groups like the Society for Illustrators is, is a very exclusive sort of group with a lot of rules. And the fact that they have cartoon work in there is, I think, pretty amazing, isn't it? Is it? Yes, absolutely. Can you tell us, tell people that don't know what, what that's about, what I'm talking about? Well, I don't know much about the Society of Illustrators, but I imagine they're quite a bit like the National Cartoonist Society, which last May had an event up in Huntington Beach, and they invited Dan Klaus, the Hernandez brothers, and myself as guests. And my friend Wayno said, they're realizing that all the old cartoonist guys are dying off, and they kind of have to keep up with the times. And the comic art form of comic books is valid. It's a valid genre now. So I would imagine the Society of Illustrators came to the same conclusion, right? Now, did you get to meet some of the other women that are included in the exhibit? Some of the, the artists that are, are haven't been around as long as, as you and, and, and your contemporaries? Well, I've only met... Linda Berry one time briefly uh, hung out with Carol Tyler two years ago at Comic Con. Uh, I've, I've seen Carol over the years, and uh, uh, Barbara Mendez was sitting uh, at Comic Fest, so I kind of finally got to know her. And I've only met Emil Ferris uh, a couple times at Comic Con. You know, when you meet somebody at Comic Con, you're not really meeting, and you're kind of like going, "Hi, hi, okay, bye, come on." Somebody grabs you, drags you away. Yeah, party time. And, yeah, and I think that's uh, that. It's Diane Newman in the show. Yeah, I believe well, so. Diane, yeah, of course. Well, Diane and I have a, a past, so um, a lot of the newer people I have met are not in that show. I have uh, well, Ebony Flowers was on a panel with me, so brief, like once again, briefly in passing. So about five or six people. Karen Karen Green had me read uh, Silver Wire. Have you read that? No. What is that? I, one of the uh, one of the artists is um, Creote Creota. I'm not sure her 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 name, but she did one, and she's fascinated with um, medical examination stuff and the history <laughs> of 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 medicine. And it's but it's in it, so she's she's sort of an expert on physiology. So she gets does this stuff uh, going into great detail about um, body parts and things. Uh, you, you should look at it. I think you would find it really. It, I, I was amazed at the diversity of the, the illustrations. It's great. I'll send you a link so that you can oh. see it. But yeah, I would love that because I, I was almost a microbiology major in college because I wanted a job that paid good money, but I can't do math. So that didn't last very long. But I, I really, I, yeah, I am in a, I have a my, one of my best friends is a doctor. And it's so neat because we both know what all these six syllable words mean and what chemistry is and all this stuff. So I think I would really like that. Oh, you'll love it. I'll make sure to, to send it and we'll post it on, on CBH as well. Um, right. so let's, let's close out with two things. Um, the, we, we've, we've mentioned the, uh, uh, Newman's drawing power, consensual rape, um, was your story, your contribution to that. Um, talk about that for just a couple of minutes in terms of that project itself, how it came to be, how you were reluctant to do it at first. And then you, you found a story that you could, you could tell. Uh, I was... Finishing up Billy the Bee, 
And as Diane Newman said, I was drowning in my project. So when she got a hold of me, that was about eight months before I finished the book and I turned her down flat uh, for two reasons, because uh, I was doing my book and I didn't think I had a story. And in that eight months, that's when that friend of mine sent me that horrible email. And then I went, okay, I got a story now, but I didn't write her back. And then she contacted me again and, and, and said, please, you've got to be in this book. You've got to be in it. And I go, all right, I, I think I can do this. So May 10th, I finished Billy the Bee and May 11th, I started working on the drawing power story. And after drawing, you know, 165 pages of animals and beautiful scenery and the lagoon, to draw this thing was just, it was, what does that thing Robert Crumb says? Every line is an act of will. And it was just the most awful thing to ever I've ever had to draw. It was depressing. I got angry all over again. I started to cry. And then I, I, I raised myself up from my bra straps and said, God damn it, I can do this. So I did. And by reliving this shit, it freed me up to do what I'm doing with my book now, The Happy Hour. So all these little things that you do, I guess they're kind of like little, like the little waves of whatever in the pond or the vibrations, they, they, they turn into other things. And that's, I, I, like I said, I hated doing that story. I can't even look at it. it makes me sick to my stomach, but um, I, it was time well spent. And, and that is available on, on Comixology for like under $7. So everybody that's listening should, should definitely read, read the book and support the book and also uh, make sure to read um, um, this story because it's, it's very good. Um, the rest of the time I want to talk about Billy the Bee, which I am so glad that I ordered and read because I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thanks! It's so different. It's so different from everything you've done in a lot of ways. And yeah, it's all there too. Um, and it goes back to, I feel like it goes back to your very beginnings and your mom and Disney and everything. Cause it's got this like almost th finger at Disney in doing it. Cause it's so not sentimental and not, and, and not Disney style. And the, the realism of it, I don't think I'd seen in, in, you'd get little bits of that in some of your work, but this is largely a very realistic thing that then brings in, in these moments of intensity, the, the cubism aspect of it. And I got to say that fight between uh, the raccoon and, and Kay is to go from the realism of those pages, and I sent it to Alex this morning, of those two pages of them starting to fight in realistic form, and then it goes to those two pages of the abstract uh, cubist aspect of it, but the emotion in that is, is as good as it gets. I mean, for me, for as a comic, it's fantastic. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks. I, was, I, wanted, to, I wanted you to be awed and horrified at the same time. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so so my question I've been asking you why do you hate uh, LA? Why do you <laughs> not like fine artists? What do you have against people? Because people I, are the villains. They are this, not anybody else. They're worse <laughs> than the skunks or the raccoons. Well, to answer your first question, I know it was kind of cute and the Disney influence, I didn't even think about it, but it's true because every Disney film always has music in it. And every Disney right. film is kind of heavy. As I tell people, or I, I often notice with people, when you start talking about Bambi, they forget that Bambi was a guy. <laughs> and, and everybody shuts down after the mother gets shot. They don't remember the rest of the movie because the mother died. But what they forget is at the end of the movie, Bambi meets a little, a little doe and they're flirting and along comes a rival. And he gets in a fight with that rival. He launches him off a cliff and kills him. Yeah. So Disney yeah. always had like really heavy stuff. And they did. So and that um, that was reused in Lion King. Lion King is basically um, Bambi on steroids, I think. Oh really? I haven't seen Lion King yet. Believe it or not. Fox and the Hound has that. Them they toss the bear off of the train tracks too, and and falls into a canyon. Oh so it's no! A, it's a real theme. 
I don't want to see that movie. <laughs> no, you probably don't. <laughs> well, anyway, after I did the judge for Hot Wire and I drew those mules, because the guy that helped me buy the gun had mules, and I go, God, I can draw animals. I go, God, that looks pretty good. So I decided to really get into cross hatching because I went to North Carolina for the zine machine uh, and mine shaft, the mine shaft people live there, uh, Everett and Joya Rand, and they had, they flew a bunch of us out there. And one of the guys was a guy named Bill Crook and he's a cross hatching king like Robert Crumb. And so I was watching him draw and I said, you know what? I can do that cross hatching and I think I can do it better. <laughs> and so I kind of took it on as a challenge to learn how to cross hatch. And because Dory Sita did that, she was very good at that too. And gosh, you know what? The more you do, the better it looks. And it really is a, it adds a third color. You know, you got black and white, but then you add that gray and it adds a color, if, if, if you know what I mean. So doing Billy, um, I had to make the bee cartoony looking for design reasons. I couldn't draw the wings with the little veins in them because I'd have to draw the veins in every single drawing of the damn bee. And they have all their legs in the middle. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Well, the legs are all in the middle. Well, you try drawing a bee with six legs over and over again. It's all going to look like a bunch of sticks and everything. So I decided some of the bees would have their legs there, but Billy, since he's a cartoon character, can have legs anywhere she wants because Billy's a queen. So that's why I put the two arms on the abdomen and the two legs in the, uh, I mean, the thorax and the two legs in the abdomen, but that would never happen. So when you see all this jewelry that's designed, nobody gets it right when they do bees bee designs they always put the legs where they feel like so that was a surprise to do that but i had to stylize it so i could draw it easy but when it came to the animals with the fur i had to learn how to draw the animals from the inside out so that the to draw the raccoon and the coyote and the turtles i drew the skeletons i got books on anatomy and did many preliminary drawings of the skeleton just like you'd learn in life drawing you know when you like draw naked people there's bones under there so, and it was very important for me to make the animals look anatomically correct. Now, people, you can, you can have fun with, you know, you can make them look anything, but yeah, people are, I mean, we've, we've, we've overpopulated the planet. We've, we've exploited animals. We've treated our natural resources very poorly. I've seen people let their dogs, that lagoon is a real place. I took 300 photos there as photo reference. And I've seen people have the, seen the dogs run around chasing rabbits, running in the lagoon, chasing the birds. Uh, I've talked to a ranger. People have released baby raccoons in the lagoon at night. They will be dead in 20 minutes. They're very territorial and they will kill each other if they're competing raccoon families. Um, and so, but I, I thought, I, but I wanted to kind of make a statement at the end with the two boys trapped the turtles because they were just being kids and they thought they were being good and they were going to return the turtles and and uh but you know but the human interaction you made their father into a total asshole he was terrible oh yeah he's like oh he's typical you know yeah yuppie guy yeah yeah but he taught he taught his kids a lesson though he made them volunteer at the lagoon and and real you know learn something about nature but yeah he's an asshole because around here there's a lot of assholes I see them all the time <laughs> running through the lagoon with their earphones on and they got the heart monitor and they're not looking at, they're missing everything. I mean, if you sit in the lagoon for half an hour, you can't believe the wonderful things you see, but you have to sit there. You have to be like an Indian, Native American, excuse me. So, so. what we're talking about is Billy the Bee, a graphic novel and it's and released uh, 2019. And it's, it, it's your first graphic novel in that sense. Correct. Yep. Um, are you are you interested in doing more now that you've done this one? Well, I wanted to do a trilogy. I wanted to have a book about Kay, and I wanted to have her get pregnant by a domestic dog, like a poodle or something. So we have a koi poodle, right? And that happens all the time where there's interbreeding. And then I wanted to do the next book about Raylene, the rattlesnake, because I like rattlesnakes, oh. and they they're oh, yeah. they're. There, there's such Ray is my favorite, or K is my favorite. I gotta say, the, the coyote the animals, huh? Oh. The coyote, which yeah. is amazing to me because up until reading that, all I thought of as coyotes is they killed my mom's cat, 
and you know, and and I had no good feeling about coyotes at all. And you made me really care about that that particular, um, at least that particular coyote was so so nice. Well, she's a very evolved coyote. They're not all, you yes. know, not all coyotes are created equal. Anyway, I told Gary Groth at Comic Con my plans, and he goes, "Mary, I'm begging you, please do an autobiographical book." And I go, "Because he goes." nobody's doing anything good everybody's too young they haven't lived they haven't done anything i go all right gary i can't i can't resist you and i said okay i got the perfect story and, and i have been wanting to tell the story about uh, for the happy hour for uh, about 20 years it's been in the back of my mind and what it is a full circle coming of age story so it starts off with me being a little artist i'm in college and i just walk away drop out get involved in the world of music for four or five crazy years. And one day my muse came back to me and I, and, and when I was in college, I wanted to do comics. I wanted to do cartooning and I, I couldn't find my path, but then I found my path. So that's how the, the book ends on it. It's a happy ending. So that's what happens. Wow. I was sitting at a party. Everybody was partying, carrying on. And I hadn't drawn anything for like four or five years. And I started drawing this telephone and I still have the drawing in a sketchbook. And I go, hey, this looks pretty good. And I go, wow, I can draw again. Went to the whiskey the next night and I started drawing all the punk rockers and making fun of them. And I go, hey, I'm a cartoonist. All right. So that's kind of what the book's about. It's a very simple story. It's nothing heavy, but I do want to make you know comments of what it was like. You know, nothing like being on stage when five cops come in with full riot gear with their guns brandished while you're on stage looking for, you know, people to beat up or kill or rape. It was horrible. And you had to, you know, they were looking for underage people in the bars, but they were using riot style tactics, like much like we're seeing today. Yeah. And I want the world to know that, 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 that being a gay person in Orange County at that time was a very risky thing to do. I uh, I wanted to close and turn it over to Alex. Um, um, I wanted to just read uh, the back cover of Life of the Party, uh, Robert Crumb's quote. Yeah, uh, the I got right here. Life, the hedonistic life that Mary Fleener's comics reflect down there is really frightening to me. Frightening. Yeah. If this is the future of the planet, oh man, how depressing. <laughs> and I, I couldn't think of a better way to close uh, and then hand it over to Alex. So thanks for indulging me on all of this. Well, thank you. Well, that's how I got the title of the book, because I sent that quote to Gary Groth. We hadn't settled on a title yet. And I go, oh, that crumb, the life of the party. And I go, bingo, there's my title. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Jim. Well, this has been a, a really fun episode of the Comic Book Historians podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. We had uh, the queen of comic uh, cubism, uh, Mary Fleener. We really appreciate it. I, I fell in love with your stuff on uh, Weirdo number three when the the shoe fetishist um, ejaculated in a cubist manner. I thought, <laughs> I thought, wow. I mean. I'm not a fetishist. I mean, high heels do add to an experience, but uh, I, I looked at that. I'm like, oh my gosh! I, I, there was a punchline there that really you could do anything with comics, and that that was a revelation for me. So, so thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me on the show. It was great. Thank you.